and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite-sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. Gosh, we are nearly through November already. This year has gone so fast, I can barely keep up. It's super cold in the UK at the moment, so it's getting nice and cosy, you know, when I can afford to put the heating on. That would be lovely. My poor cats and my hot water bottles at the moment, and I hope wherever you are, you are keeping warm and ready for the winter ahead. Thankfully though, this week we can pretend to be in slightly warmer climates, although you would consider ancient Persia a pretty warm place, modern day Iran gets pretty cold in the winters, so maybe not. Anyway, this week we are looking at the majestic Middle Eastern unicorn, the Karkadan. The Karkadan is probably best described as just that, the unicorn of the Middle East, but it does have some slight differences to the European unicorn. Firstly, it's sometimes considered more of a rhino than a horse, and is hidden within its etymology as well as its appearance that is so. It's said that the Karkadan has thick scaly skin, much like a rhino, with three yellow hooves on each foot, one hoof at the front and two at the back. It has a short stubby little tail and a single horn that faces towards the face of the animal, with the ears and lips like a donkey. Over time, the horn was changed from curving into the head of the animal to pointing directly up much like a javelin pole, and was pretty long like that too. Honestly, the best description I can give you is straight from the scholar who started the whole phenomena off, which is, and I quote, the build of a buffalo, a black scaly skin, a dewlap hanging down under the skin, it has three yellow hooves on each foot, the tail is not long, the eyes lie low farther down the cheek than is the case of other animals. On top of the nose there is a single horn which is bent upwards, which was later adapted into the horn is conical, bent back towards the head, and longer than a span. The animal's ears protrude from both sides like those of a donkey, and its upper lip forms into a finger shape, like the protrusion on the end of an elephant's trunk. I mean... Are you picturing what I'm picturing? Sure you are, but we're going to pretend that we don't know what this animal is for the sake of the podcast and for just adventure. It is said that they live in ancient Persia, which is now Iran, Iraq, India and northern Africa, roaming the desert for foliage and granting good luck to passers-by, especially women. And this is where the traditional unicorn myth differs from this monster, It's said to bless all women, virgin or not. Women who were looking to become pregnant were the biggest beneficiaries of the Karkadan's powers, as it was said that if a Karkadan touches the water that a woman wishing for a child is swimming in, they would become pregnant. Not by the beast, I will add. Naturally, the next time they tried. It's said that this beast, like the European unicorn, can only be tamed by those pure virgin girls, and will lay their head in their laps once tamed. It could also be tamed by a single dove, as they love their songs, and would often wait under a tree and wait for a dove to land on their horn so that they could enjoy the song. However, outside of this situation, it's a very solitary creature and does not tolerate any other animal other than a dove within a hundred yards of it, and if so, they become incredibly aggressive and would charge at anything within its vicinity without hesitation, sometimes leaving the prey impaled on its horn. They've also had a loud and haunting call, which can be heard for several miles across the desert, much like the Monoceros, which is one of the earliest unicorn myths from Greek mythology. Much like the unicorn though, it's said that the Karkadan's horn is a cure for most ailments, including constipation, epilepsy and lameness, as well as an antidote to any poison. It's said that only an elephant can kill a Karkadan, but this is from only one story where a Karkadan killed the elephant with its horn and then the dead elephant fell on it, so it might just be any big animal really. There is a pretty cool story that the Karkadan and the elephant are mortal enemies, 
and when a Karkadan sees an elephant, it will jump to a nearby tree, sharpen its horn on the trunk, and then it will charge, stabbing the elephant on the underside with its horn, but then it will be unable to get the elephant carcass off of the horn. Eventually, the Karkadan lies down in exhaustion, and both the elephant and the Karkadan are taken off by a rock, the ancient Persian bird of prey. I did do an episode on them not too long ago, but I thought this was a great story, and if you want to hear more about the rock, please go find the episode. Now, the etymology of this monster is where it gets slightly more interesting. The word Karkadan comes from the Sanskrit Kadga, which means rhinoceros, but also sword, implying the sword horns. Another interpretation is the Persian word Kargadan, meaning lord of the desert, but my favourite is the Kurdish, which is a variation of the word Karkitdan, meaning donkey with one horn, which makes me laugh quite a lot, but I mean, if it doesn't summarise a rhino, I don't know what does. But I will say the funniest thing here is that Karkadan means unicorn and rhino in ancient Persian, so you can see the confusion is pretty rife. The history behind this monster, though, is a little bit bland, I'm afraid, in comparison to the etymology and their description, but it is still quite interesting. The first mention of these monsters were in the 10th and 11th century from the Persian scholar Abu Rayyan al-Burani, who lived between 973 and 1048, and he gave the description I read at the beginning of the episode of these monsters that I quoted. He then decided to change his mind about the horn size, if you remember, and what it looked like, because he didn't like artistic interpretations of the beast. Bearing in mind, he had no first-hand experiences with the monster. Why he was writing the piece is absolutely lost to me. Then, in the 1200s, a Persian physician, Zachariah al Kazwini, linked the horn to these beneficial effects, such as the healings and the inevitable destroying of poison. He is the first documented person to link the Karkadan with the European unicorn officially within his writings. Lastly, in the 14th century, Ibn Battuta, who was a very, very famous scholar and explorer within the Afro-Eurasian space, said that he saw a Karkadan in India fighting off anyone who came near its territory. This was then written down in the epic 1001 Nights in the second voyage of Sinbad the Sailor immortalising the Karkadan forever in one of the most popular stories of the ages. The last mention of the Karkadan in literature was in a poem called A Few Questions I Posed to the Unicorn by Tafik Sai in 1971 and is considered one of the strangest and most remarkable poems in the Arabic language and is all about the Karkadan, not the European unicorn. There have never been any real bodies of Karkadan pulled up anywhere, unfortunately. Only those of, funnily enough, rhinos and horses. I mean, we've also not found evidence of the western unicorn, so what did you expect here? What does make me slightly sad with all of this is that given the idea that the horn has magical powers, we do know that modern day rhinos are hunted for this exact thing, and I really hope that the Karkadan legend didn't start this off. I can't find any evidence to link these two things together, but I really do hope that this folkloric tale didn't start this horrible hunt for horns. Don't try and say that too quickly, I know I did. But that may actually be a thing, it might be the reason people think they have medicinal properties, and that does make me so so sad to think about. In more modern times though, Iraq still has a tradition linked to the Karkadan. These are reddish beads used in the Misbaha, the Muslim prayer beads, and they are called the Tears of the Karkadan or Dimu al Karkadan. The legend says that when a rhinoceros spends days in the desert looking for water, he weeps when he finally finds it out of fatigue and thirst pain. These tears, as they fall into the water of the drinking hole, turn into beads which people collect and use in their prayer beads, which I think is a really cute little tribute to this monster. But now on to modern media. There isn't much specifically on this monster this week, literally there is one thing. So I've gone with the kind of angry unicorn slash rhino vibe this week in my recommendations. For art though, you can see the Karkadan in some of their ancient drawings, however none of them have artists or names attached to them. The most famous is from the Walters manuscript, which comes under W659, I'm not sure what that really relates to which does depict a Karkadan, 
Otherwise, you can look up some of the medieval bestiary drawings, which you can just find by popping the word Karkadan into Google Images. And of course, look at the independent stuff coming out of this. It is really cool. I really love how different they can all be in regards to how much inspiration they take from rhinos and unicorns and the percentage of inspiration in each one. I really recommend looking into them. But in movies, we have Unicorn Wars, The Cabin in the Woods, The Sword and the Stone, Robin Hood, Ice Age, The Lego Movie, and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. For TV, we have My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Delicious in Dungeon, Doctor Who, Legends of Tomorrow, Adventure Time, Robot Check-In, Regular Show, Jimmy Two Shoes, Gravity Falls, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Unikitty, Freak Town, Power Rangers Jungle Fury, Ace Lightning, Beast Wars, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Stormhawks, and Spliced. Now, in video games, we have the two that are actual Karkadam references. We have Pathfinder and Far Cry 4. Far Cry 4 are the biggest one here. But we also have Final Fantasy, Elder Scrolls Oblivion and Skyrim, Fate, NetHack, Overlord, Pokemon, Robot Unicorn Attack, Dwarf Fortress, Warcraft, World of Warcraft, Viva Pinata, Terraria, Dragon Age Inquisition, Minecraft, Shin Megami Tensei, Jitsu Squad, Mega Man X3 and ZX, Mother 3, Spyro Year of the Dragon, Temtem, Beautiful Joe and Warframe. And lastly, my book recommendation this week is Mythology of Mesopotamia, Fascinating Insights, Myths, Stories and History from the World's Most Ancient Civilization by History Brought to Life. Now this is a great summary for all of these Mesopotamian cultures such as Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Persian, Assyrian, all of the above. So it's really lesser studied in terms of mythologies. I really do recommend having a look at this one if you fancy delving into something a little bit different and not as often covered. Now it's time for Do I Think They Existed? I'm sorry, come on. I think it definitely exists, but it's definitely a rhino. <laughs> I really don't think there's any debate on this. I just think people saw rhinos. <laughs> I can't explain the pregnancies or the virgin tamings, but in cartoons, rhinos sometimes have birds on their horns and they're really chill about them. I honestly cannot see that this is not a rhino. Honestly though, this is such a stretch, but I think I said the same about unicorns to be fair, it seems a lot of the time this kind of animal is just misidentification or a lack of knowledge on the actual animal it is. So giving it a mythical stamp is the easy way out, especially in earlier times. And as much as I respect this culture and this monster, and I wish I could have come up with this one, I'm going to say no. I also will say I have a thing against rhinos, because when I went to Animal Kingdom, which is the Disney park, the zoo one, when I was 17 in Florida, we went on the safari bit and a rhino full on charged into the back of the bus I was sat on. It was close enough so that when it walked off, I could touch its butt, like that's how close it was. It was very cool, but it was also very scary. And since then, I do not like rhinos. I will not entertain them. And I love zoos, right? And I will stress conservation-based zoos. I won't let the vegans come for me and the animal rights people. I love conservation-based zoos. I will not, and I will repeat this, I will not go to the rhino bit because I don't want to see them. They upset me. And it's very sad because I really love elephants and giraffes and stuff and they're usually in the same bits and I miss out on those because I don't want to see rhinos because they're actively traumatic to me. <laughs> anyway, what do you think? Did the Karkdan roam the earth once upon a time and cause some havoc with elephants? Let me know on Twitter, I would really love to know what you think. It was certainly a cool monster, but definitely not my favourite for obvious reasons. It was very difficult to research though, I will say, without ending up in the same three paragraphs of information over and over again. So I am genuinely impressed that I managed to get about 15 minutes out of this. It's certainly though an interesting take on something that we have so ingrained into Western culture, and especially here in the UK, the unicorn is the Scottish animal, so it's very much interesting to see a Middle Eastern take on it. Next week, though, we are heading back over to the Philippines because, well, I really love the mythology from this part of the world, and it has been a while. We are looking at the wonderful yet tricksy Encanto next Thursday, so please make sure you don't get tempted by their songs along the way. I would love to have you listen. 
For now though, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you are listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next. And I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok, YouTube and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast. And the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can always be found at mythmonsters.co.uk and you can find us on Good Pods and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast too. Come join the fun though. Sheds with your pals. They might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky. And I'll see you later, babes. Bye.